Right, okay, Edward Hopper. Quite a sea change from Titian and Artemisia, Gentileschi. There's a self-portrait. I'll just admit this, um, oh, it worked all right. There's a self-portrait of Edward Hopper. I deliberately called the session the paintings of Edward Hopper rather than the life and paintings of Edward Hopper. The reason being that, frankly, Edward Hopper's life isn't very interesting. He devoted it exclusively to painting, had one marriage which lasted his lifetime, no affairs that we know of, no children, and very little, little relocating. In fact, the lack of biographic meat allows us to concentrate solely on his work, which may indeed have us scratching our heads looking for themes, symbols, allegories, perhaps personal mythologies, but largely coming up blank. And he painted very few portraits. This is a rare portrait, one of his mother. Some have tried to interpret his paintings with reference to mysticism and other vague religious notions. It's also been said that his art veered from impressionism towards surrealism and conceptual art. On the other hand, others link his work with the zeitgeist of modern living, with the self-reliance of the individual a la Nietzsche and the increasing secularization of human society in the 20th century. But I would say Hopper's paintings are standalone expressions of whatever we each individually decide he is attempting to express. In other words, they are what they are, and it's up to each of us to take from them what we can. And I suppose by simply and perhaps unhelpfully saying that, I'm evoking some sort of existential appreciation. He certainly seems to have something to say about the non-committal isolation of the individual in a world he or she never asked to be in. In the final analysis, man and woman ultimately alone in society, just as humanity appears to be alone in the cosmos. Anyway, let's look at the paintings and you decide. Uh, some somebody is um, has, isn't muted for some reason. Perhaps they care to mute. Um, this is his, ha his house where he was born. It is now an art centre, the Hopper Art Centre, and a museum. Hopper was born in 1882 in Nyack on the Hudson River. He died in 1967 at the age of 85. His family were of English and Dutch descent on his father's side and English and Welsh descent on his mother's side. They were a middle-class family and belonged to a Baptist church. His father uh, ran a, what the Americans call a dry goods store and dry goods seems to be um, more to do with textiles and haberdashery and, and that sort of thing rather than groceries. <coughs> Edward, who enjoyed drawing at an early age, started signing his work from the age of 10. At 17, he enrolled in the Correspondence School of Illustrating in New York, transferring a year later to the New York School of Art. In 1906, he had finished his training and went to Paris for a year. In 1908, he was working in New York for an advertising agency as an illustrator. He painted in his spare time. The first painting he sold for $250 was this one called Sailing. It had been exhibited in a 1911 exhibition in Cologne. He sold nothing else for the next 10 years and his work went largely unnoticed. However, in 1919, he won first prize in a war poster competition with this poster called Smash the Hun. It was thus as an illustrator that he first achieved public recognition, though oils were his first love. He just couldn't make any money from them. 
1923, he married the artist Joe Nivison, a formidable opinionated woman by all accounts, with no sense of humor whatsoever, and who came to be envious of his success. He championed his watercolors, which he'd hitherto neglected, and they drew very positive reviews following a one-man show in a prestigious New York gallery. This success persuaded him to give up his work as an illustrator, and the couple rented an apartment in Washington Square, which they kept for the rest of their life. In fact, he died there. From the 1920s, there was very little change to the remainder of their lives. Although in 34, they did build a studio house in South Truro, where, where he was able to create a large window facing north to gather the north light, which he insisted was best, well, most artists um, prefer to paint by north light. Uh, South Truro was in Massachusetts, not, not sort of northeast of New York, not that far away, I suppose, <laughs> relatively speaking, considering the vast distances America boasts of. And there they spent their summer months and many of his um, paintings are, um, are, are find, find their origin there. One of, one of his first paintings, Road to Maine, this was painted in 1914, measuring two foot by just over two foot, two foot six probably, already anticipates the character of his later work with its heavily bowed, loaded brushes and cropping. Human presence is only suggested by the telegraph poles. I'll let you take that one in for a moment. I haven't got much to say about it really. It looks very much like an early work. This is a more interesting painting. It's called Soir Bleu. Uh, it's a large painting measuring six foot um, long by three foot deep. It was painted in 1914 and it is a good example of the French connection. Um, Hopper went to France three times around about that time. It's said that he identified with the figure of the clown who he saw as the artist in society. The clown is surrounded by a heavily made up woman taken to be a whore. The man sitting on the extreme left, likely to be her pimp, pimp and looks rather shady to me. The characters cropped on the right are distinctly middle class, while the two in the middle at the clown's table are a man uh, of working class background probably, and a military man. The cropping and unusual perspectives are said to be influenced by Degas following those visits to France. Um, Degas did crop his paintings, but not to the extent that um, Hopper did. Cropping, as you, as you probably know anyway, you'll see a major feature of his paintings. <clears throat> as I say, he made three visits to France at about this time. He was highly intellectual, Hopper was, he enjoyed reading French and Russian classics in the original but he was soon to leave the French influence behind and develop his own individual style, a style which made his works unique and changed little from the 1920s to the 60s. Although the swift brush stroke work favored by the Impressionists never entirely left his paintings. His landscapes became increasingly spacious and his figures isolated. This painting is called Small Town Station, painted in 1920. Quite a small painting, two foot by, two foot by three foot, I suppose. It marks a point of departure from early influences. The railway, either by means of peripheral buildings or simply the track, makes frequent appearances in his work and seems to hold a fascination for him. There's no track in this one, but there we've got the um the, the small railway station um rather neatly done i think with the sun on this side and not too much shadowing uh, uh, on the others 
It has to be said that Hopper's paintings are never easy to fathom. We know more, almost nothing about his intentions other than a putative wish to portray reality as he saw it. His figures never return the viewer's gaze, so we're compelled to objectify as onlookers. They have a strange, vacant stare, so that we have to ask, what is going on in their minds? Hopper's windows usually invite us to look into their rooms. Whether we're comfortable with it or not, he forces us into the role of voyeur. In this painting called Summer Interior, just over two foot square, painted in 1909, Hopper molds the scene candidly with utter detachment. The girl, naked from the waist down, is sitting on a sheet. Why? Are we to infer from the way she's undressed that this, is, this scene follows a sexual encounter that has probably gone wrong, that she's been possibly abandoned by her lover and somehow has slipped this constantly onto the floor via the sheet? Because he's, the way he's painted her head, we can't tell, but we can assume she may well be crying. Either way, she's lost in thought, abstracted, turned in upon herself, as many of his figures are. The paintwork, uh, uh, as you can see, is impressionistic. And look at the yellow slats on these, what I take to be Venetian blinds. They're just done with horrid yellow strokes. Um, and the the grate here, the, the, the chimney, the uh, fireplace seems to be painted very quickly and without much care. The, there seems to be a smudge over this, the left hand side. I don't know whether that's deliberate. And the clock is just one or two quick strokes of the brush. There's no attempt at any sort of detail. It's all, the whole point of the point picture is to focus on the girl on the floor and even her chemise or her vest, her, her top clothing here, again painted very quickly, a la the Impressionist, I think. In 11 a.m., this, this painting is called 11 a.m., we don't know why, painted in 1926, sometime later, and, and a slightly larger painting measuring three foot by just under three foot, we see a woman, this time completely nude, again lost in her own thoughts, gazing out of a window. Harper once said, I was never able to paint what I set out to paint. Again, the furniture in the room, which is uh, rather um, uh, a cluttered room, really, but it, it's painted without any detail. The painting on the wall there above the chest of drawers is it's just a daub really. Um, the bed is cropped, heavily cropped and seems to be unmade. This chair on the extreme right cropped again. This table at the bottom is cropped. The window is cropped. There only seems to be one curtain. Uh, the whole ambience of this room seems to be one of dishevelment really. But the woman, and there's very little care taken to um, express the flesh as it might appear in re reality. She's given it a sort of pale, almost white color for some reason. But the focus is on this woman. Why is she nude? She hasn't bothered to get dressed yet. She's quite happy to sit in front of an open window, probably many stories high up. And then we've just got a glimpse of the outside world there with the block work of the, of the building which she's in. We don't know why it's called 11 a.m., but it does at least tell us the time of day. Similarly, in this, ho this one called Hotel Room, 1931, it's a larger canvas, uh, five foot by um, nearly six foot. We look in on another moment of self-absorption. It's as though Hopper's set out to paint moments of isolation, of loneliness perhaps of despair, negative aspects of living in the moment, the reality of contemporary life as he saw it. 
and and uh, again heavy heavy cropping this wall is cropped here um, and then the wall crops the bed at that point and this uh, chest of drawers here is cropped on the left a cloche hut is sort of precariously balanced on the end of it there it's obviously a hotel room because there are a, a luggage there and there's a um, some article of clothing just draped over this armchair. Again, the woman is painted in her underclothes and rather quickly painted. The highlights in her hair, for argument's sake, again done with a quick brush with very little um, attention to any sort of detail. She seems to be reading a pamphlet, I would think, rather than a book. Um, but she looks, yes, she looks certainly um, desolate, I would say. In City Sunlight, painted much later in 1954, he continues with the same theme, painted in much the same way. The windows and furniture are cropped so that we are instantly drawn to the seated figure, again in a state of undress. Is there an element of titillation? in his depictions of these women. And if there is, why? Hopper himself was a very quiet man. He was slow speaking and slow to move. Um, you wouldn't, I think, you, you got to know him through his various biographies and documentaries. You wouldn't think him interested in titillation, but we have to draw our own conclusions about that. The cropping typically suggests the periphery of our vision when focused on the individual or the raison d'etre of the painting. It's what we would see unless we turned our head to deliberately survey the room. These windows uh, uh, fascinate me behind, behind it because they obviously are looking out across a, a courtyard or an alleyway or something at, at, at windows in the, in the opposite window. And, and the, together with the muted colours, they sort of tend to suggest a Ben Nicholson painting to me. However, that's by the by. In Morning in the City, painted in 1944, this measures six foot by four foot, the nude again is staring out of the window. The model is Hopper's wife, Jo. It's said that after his marriage, he was permitted the use of only one single model herself. Yet sometimes he changes the features, often the nose, so that we fail to recognise her. Basically, he's using her body. He uses her again in Morning Sun, painted in 1952, a somewhat smaller canvas. Again, partially clothed, introspective, and staring out of the window at the city. The city, um, the, the city symbolized by this warehouse and this bright sort of orange red which draw, uh, building which draws our eyes. And then, and then again, the sun has caught the side of the building here. And, and so he, caught, he painted that in a, a very pale yellow. He's more interested in colour in this painting, I think. We've got this rectangle of very light blue um, cast by the, the light through the window. And um, people, are architects, people who know, know what they're talking about have generally criticised his his, his depictions of light in rooms they say it, it, these windows wouldn't possibly throw that sort of a, a light but I don't think that's uh, Hopper's particularly interested about that he, he's creating a painting uh, I've, I've gone off on a tangent then slightly lost where I, where I, where I am right are these women indulging in a moment of composure before heading out into the world before facing workaday life either that or she's seen something of interest out of the window but she's clearly very high up um several stories high i would i would imagine again very little attention to detail with the painting but i do like the sh uh, the way he's positioned her on the bed there it's just it's it's basically a classic um triangle isn't it 
and she looks very determined. She's certainly working something out. A Woman in the Sun, 1961, and we might say that all these, apart from the first one, they are all women in the sun. She's fully nude this time and smoking a cigarette. There's a large rectangle of light on the floor describing a window we don't see. We only see the cropped curtain and barely that, really. The other window is also cropped, as is the bed, as is this painting on the wall. There's an independence of spirit about this woman. Is she thinking, this is my life to decide how I want to live? Very strong features. And you can see, uh, you can see his wife's features in, in, in this particular nude, I think. I like the way the, sky, the sun has kissed the hills outside there, uh, the rather strong green and yellow, which contrasts with these muted pastel colours of the room itself and the way the, the sun has caught the windowsill as well. And she seems to be standing almost on a runner. The light has made a runner for her to stand on. Intriguing. As I've already mentioned, Hopper appears drawn to railways, though rarely depicting trains. Yet there are other facets of social infrastructure which interest him to the point of painting them. Bridges, service stations, office blocks, detached dwellings, all familiar landmarks of 20th century America, where, of course, modernity led the world. This painting is called Manhattan Bridge. Very small painting. It's only 12 inches by 20 inches. A curious painting because I, I cannot work out the architecture of this bridge. It sweeps down, typically cropped, of course, on the right. It sweeps down almost onto the bank there, but and yet, and yet we've got these the support columns which don't seem which seem to be disengaged from it completely. And there are the uh, and are quite with the, the the steel wires or whatever they are that these bridges have. So I don't know why he's painted it like that, but it's obviously deliberate. And these vehicles on the key side here are painted again very quickly, but the the, the colours, the contrasting colours, the dark um, Van Dyke browns that he's used there, or umbers with the, the with the yellows, I think they work very well. In fact, this is a a painting of contrasts. Uh, he's not he's not, he's not frightened to be unsubtle. This is a famous painting, Gas, 1940 measuring two foot by three and a half foot. It's twilight. <clears throat> We've got to assume that from the way the lights are, are, are painted. The pump attendant is about his work, half hidden. The three pumps stand like statues, some have suggested like Egyptian deities. And the roof of the service station is a curious design, suggesting possibly a place of worship. Is Popper suggest, uh, suggesting oil is the new god of the 20th century, or are critics reading too much into his depiction of small uh, town life? One French cri critic decided that a black car full of gangsters had already disappeared down the road, having been served by this pump attendant. Where on earth he gets that from, I have no idea. There's no evidence of any car there at all. He, but he's bringing his own narrative to the to the painting. The the um, because it's twilight, the trees in the background are a little more than daubs, to be honest. With with these these um, straight lines suggesting their trunks, Hopper just doesn't seem to be interested in the landscapes of these paintings. Really, he's more interested in that's what he's interested in the pumps and the man. And he's half hidden the man for some reason, and the light coming out of the service station. The reds work very well, of course, and there is something hypnotic about these three um, pumps standing enfilade like they do, much taller than the man. Are they unreasonably tall? I wonder. Um, I don't know. Maybe not. 
it's a mood painting, an ambience painting. That's probably what he's actually trying to paint. With no customers in sight, there's an air of desolation or desperation, perhaps suggested by the dead grass growing alongside. Yet in Four Lane Road, and curiously called Four Lanes, because I can only count two, one, two, there's surely little hint of deeper meaning. The pump attendant rests while his wife regales him from an open window. It's supposed to be a busy road, but we don't see any traffic and he's not doing much business. And what is it that's throwing this blue shadow on the ground and wall behind the man? And why is it blue? He's a typical hopper man, lantern jaw, sharp, large nose, fair hair, muscular, world weary, a working man, perhaps content in his own solitude. Whatever she's saying to him, his face doesn't register it. He's disengaged. The colours are loud, plain washes, strong verticals and horizontals. There's something deliberately naive about this painting. The pumps look so new. Have they ever drawn petrol? House by the Railroad. This is a well-known hopper painting. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with it. It's quite a small painting, two, two foot by just over two foot painted in 1925. It said there's something anthropomorphic about this dwelling, and I, I, it's hard to say why, but um, you can see that there is, it's almost as though it's got, a, it's got an attitude. It's a painting with attitude, I think. Hopper seems to have placed it on a plinth of railway lines, back come the railway lines into his paintings. He makes us look, at it, look up at it or look up to it, from the other side of the tracks, exciting in us a sort of veneration, perhaps. It's also reminiscent of the house in Psycho, which it's said may have been modelled on it. Notice how the walls in shadow on the front of the building, where the column portico stands, are painted roughly in contrast to the sunlit facade, where there's far more attention than given to detail. Even so, it's an impressionist's style. The house appears to be leaning, yet the vertical lines are parallel with the painting's edge. It's as though by playing around with perspective, Hopper makes the viewer uneasy, gives it a dreamlike quality. It's been suggested the image has the characteristic of being seen from a moving train or a car as this painting called New York, New Haven and Hartford, painted in 1931. Um, definitely looks as though it's been painted from a railway carriage. It's known that the Hoppers bought a car in 1927, and a lot of these pictures were possibly sketched from it as Joe drove along. There's no sense of time passing in these paintings. It's as if they suggest cinematic moments celluloid stills frozen in time. Hopper knew he was aiming for the unachievable. And I think by painting these trees, as he has done uh, quickly and sketchily, he's given the impression of speed. Uh, 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 everything is a blur and it definitely suggests he's seeing this image from a passing train, from the carriage of a passing train. I don't think there's much doubt about that. And again, he's used a lot of contrast, the, the, the bright pale blue sky against these heavy darks, suggesting the shadows in the trees and the roofs as well. He's not afraid of contrast. I quite like contrast. Cape Cod, he, Cape Cod Evening, Painted in 1939, a somewhat larger painting, 32 inches by 40. Hopper described this painting in these words. It is no exact transcription of a place, but pieced together from sketches and mental impressions of things in the vicinity. The grove of locust trees was done from sketches of trees nearby. The doorway of the house comes from Orleans, about 20 miles from here. 
the figures were done almost entirely without models and the dry blowing grass can be seen from my studio window in late summer or autumn. The dog is listening to something, probably a whippoorwill or some evening sound. That's the end of his quote. We can see there's little interaction between the couple and the dog. Typically his figures have that wooden abstracted look as though examples of another species of mankind. But the painting captures an evening calmness while that monstrous anthill of a too busy world, as Wordsworth puts it, is still unhushed for an indefinite time. There's something really hypnotic about this painting. And he's painted the facade of the house with, quite, with, with care. The lines are very pure, the colour is bright and a very, very pale azure. The man, a typical hopper man again, same sort of features that he usually uses, um, is either going to throw something for the dog or beckoning the dog, but the dog is completely uninterested. And it has been suggested because this painting was painted at the outbreak of World War II that um, and I think this is fanciful myself personally, but the dog has picked up on something that's coming. Um, I don't know. I think that's reading too much into the painting. And I like the woman again modelled on Joe, standing there, her work done for the day, presumably, and she's just wondering what's going to happen between the man and the dog, I think. There is something very calming about this painting. It could be the the grass, these this sort of light ochre, yellow ochre and siennas that he's mixed together and uh, in washes and, uh, and uh, very thin paint and, and, and they sort of meld into the fur of the dog. The dog's got a lovely face too. This painting is called High Noon, painted in 1949, measuring 26 by 42. For this picture, Hopper made a cardboard model of the house and put it in the sun to study and paint the effects of the light and shade. There's a deliberate interaction between the partially open curtains and the woman's bathrobe so that once again we are titillated and forced to be the voyeur. Hopper has made, Hopper, Hopper has made sure that cleavage and belly are on display. Just why? So it's suggested that this partially open curtain here and this partially open here relate to the woman's partially opened bathrobe there. And we have to ask, why is she standing like that in an open door? Why hasn't she covered herself up properly? We'll never know. And of course, she's a typical American girl, long blonde hair, tall, young. The house is cropped on the right here. It doesn't give us the entire house, just how far the house extends on the right, we will never know. The red of the chimney and the foundation brickwork work well with the light gray of the roof. There's a suggestion that all the flat surfaces are built up with thin washes, particularly the sky, and again, the grass in the, as we saw in the previous, um, in fact, this could almost be a watercolour. It's not, it's oils, but it could almost be a watercolour. Cape Cod Morning, 1950, measuring 34 by 40. In this painting, we see a woman in the window. Joe again, we're getting to recognise her features now, I think. At least she's a little animated. She's either seen something of interest or she's eager to get on with the day. The trees and grass again seem of little interest to Hopper, painted with thick loaded brushes and a little variety of colour. We might say again naively painted, using the word naively in the painterly sense. The very heavy shadow uh, on this bay window here, and I'm not sure about these, when I take to be shutters, these long, thin, dark rectangles of colour they don't seem to be hinged to the window anyway they're just simply it's just simply painted on 
in situ, as it were. But it, it, it's the woman we focus on. She's leaning forward. She's eager. She's anxious to look out. Again, a suggestion of cleavage there. He, he does like his cleavage, does Hopper. I'll leave you with that thought. And then we move into the city. This is called The City, painted in 1927, measuring 27 by 36 inches. City versus countryside motivate much of Hopper's work. He seems fascinated by the impersonal dulling ethos of urban existence. And here we have a view over roofs from an elevated vantage point. The elaborate mansard roof recalls Parisian architecture and can contrast starkly with the rectangular many-windowed warehouse or mill behind it. The colours are soft, ochre-based, and I find them pleasing. And the tall buildings are cropped. There's a skyscraper there and what purports to be a skyscraper there. And because we already, we've already got an idea of how tall this building is and that warehouse there, we can see that they're, they're monstrous. But he's, uh, he's cropped them. And, 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 and the, the, the effect of that is to lead our eye out of the picture, out of the top of the picture, as does this warehouse leads us to the left of the picture. And I suppose we could say the bottom leads us to the left of the right of the picture there and this very elaborately painted old-fashioned architecturally uh, architecture uh, to the bottom so that is fairly square in the middle but we, we, we're invited to look every which way but at that i suppose in, in inevitably we return to that and that would be that would be his point <clears throat> Approaching a city, painted in 1946, 26 by 37. Most of Hopper's paintings are sort of in excess of two foot by three foot, that sort of, you don't, there aren't too many large canvases. Hopper said that interest, curiosity and fear were the three emotions one experienced on entering a city by train, all three of which are secreted in this tunnel we are about to enter. The tenement buildings look undowly, their windows painted through an impressionist's eye. It's a pristine wall devoid of graffiti which fascinates, cutting the scene in half and painted again with light washes. He's not very interested in these very dull tenement buildings or warehouses as in the case there. It's this wall and the tunnel and the tunnel certainly sucks in our gaze. Um, that's where we're heading, we know that. Of course, in this day and age, this wall would be covered in graffiti as most of the walls going into Euston are these, <coughs> but uh, not in this painting. This painting is called Summertime, painted in 1943. Yet again, as in High Noon, there's a correspondence between the teasing curtains on the girl's left and her translucent dress. The curtain obscures while the dress reveals. He paints her self-assertive, confident and freestanding like the portico columns. But surrounded by all that concrete architecture, she still looks vulnerable, a proud beauty so easily crushed if the paint, if the building ever collapsed. I like the, I like the whites just hin, just hinted with, tinged with blue, very, very, and the yellows there, it's, 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 it, they're almost pastel colors really, very clean, no hint of litter or, road detritus or staining on the walls it's a very clean picture and the hat the color of the hat is picked up in the uh, the blinds i take these to be blinds at the window there 
in New York pavements painted in 1924, again roughly about the same size, two foot square, just over that, painted almost 20 years earlier, we have a very similar building with open windows. The curtains on the left playfully inviting us to peep through them to again play the voyeur. The nun's headdress is also plagued by the wind as she hurries past pushing her pram. She's cropped in her dash across the bottom of the picture, which perhaps emphasises the bustle of a figure caught in the moment against the facade's solidness. It gives the impression of speed and movement, whereas there's no movement whatsoever apart from the curtain. The suggestion of the curtain there, um, this curtain is not moving, but again, it's partially open. The dark blue colour of her habit contrasts starkly with the pale ochre siennas and yellows of the concrete block work. We're invited to look down on the scene as though from a window opposite, whereas in the previous painting we were street level. There are no shadows. He's, he's not interested in any shadows. The source of the light seems to be from the well, from that, that direction, I think, from the from the right. So there wouldn't be any shadows. It's in the full glare of the of daylight. This contrasts quite severely with the previous two. There's something saucy about this painting called Night Windows, painted in 1928. Slightly bigger painting, just under three foot square. In this pa painting, we had again beckoned in by a touting curtain, but this time to spy on the rump of a woman in pink, in a pink slip, which is all we see of her. The shades of the seaside postcard here, I think. What is she doing? The other two windows don't appear to have curtains. Only this one has curtains. Why don't they have curtains? In Hopper's paintings, we always seem to be asking why. Why has he painted it like this? Does he even know why he's painted it like this? And as I will come to later on in a, in a famous quote of Hopper's, he probably admits to not really knowing why he paints it like he does. But of course, we've got the very dark brickwork out here and the outside and, and below there. And that, because that's dark, of course, we cannot do anything else but look through these windows because they're so bright. The radiator there, there's the crop bed and there's some sort of furniture on this side. I'm not quite sure what it is. But what is this woman doing? We've got to supply our own narrative to this painting. Or it's just what you might see in any typical nighttime window. Maybe she's getting dressed to go out, go to the theatre or a concert or something like that. Maybe she's looking for something. She's lost. Whatever she's doing, she's in her underwear, that's for sure. Room in New York has been called a modern allegory. Well, we could, we could apply that term to almost all these paintings. There's a sense of boredom in this room. We're looking in through a window again. The furniture is painfully cruded so that we concentrate on the figures in activity. The light source is above. In Hopper's paintings, mood is rarely reflected to the figures expressions, but rather their body language or lack of it. This is typical of a Hopper interior, evoking a mental state. It's as though he found his inspiration either in the boredom of a small town or in the ennui of big city life. And there's a suspense in this room, not, nothing, not about the man particularly, he's quietly reading his newspaper, but this, he's maybe take it to be his wife possibly, she's, her fingers poised, it's not actually playing a note. It's about to play a note, and because she's only going to use one finger, we suspect that she can't really play the piano. She's just going to make us make it make a sound, the sort of thing you might do if you were bored, I suppose. Notice the um, notice the column here. He likes his columns. Does Hopper? His theatre paintings particularly capture this tedium and lack of purpose. In New York movie, 
painted in 1939, and this is a slightly bigger painting, 33 by 40. Most of the seats are empty, and it's the boredom of the usherette on the left which draws our attention darkly, standing at the foot of a well-lit exit. He shows us the way out clearly enough. We assume she has seen the film countless times and is petrified by the dull routine of her work. And you can see he's cropped the screen there, but you can quite, silly, quite clearly see it's a black and white, um, old black and white film. Uh, and there's a couple there sitting, but they're the only seats that are occupied. There's a sort of purple undercolour to all this painting. She's dressed in purple and these dark colours are purple tinged as well. And work quite quite well with the um with sorry things like something going on appears to be going on with my cursor, I don't know why. Um, but they work quite well with these um tangerine colours, orange colours. This one is called First Row Orchestra, painted in 1951. This is again so very severely cropped. And the figures again are waiting, they're waiting for the performance to begin. We just got this woman's legs here. This woman is particularly painted and fully painted and this man leaning forward there and saying something about the programme presumably to her, although she doesn't seem to be very interested. There are two more figures there. There's nobody in the box yet. Um, so we're all just in a um, state of suspense, suspension. As these are in, in this painting called Two on the Isle, painted almost 25 years before, before, and slightly larger paintings as well, 38 by 44. The couple have arrived early for the performance. We know that because the pit, the orchestra pit, is empty but there's a sense somehow that most of the remaining seats will never be filled i don't know why i say that but i just get that feeling maybe because i'm sort of i'm on hopper's wavelength now the woman in evening dress on the right waits alone for the performance to begin with has she been stood up or has a partner not arrived yet we don't know Together, these paintings suggest shades of waiting for Godot in the sense that a huge part of human existence is spent waiting for something to happen. There's a desperate isolation about these, his figures. Collectively, they seem to hint at an existential lifestyle which lines Hopper up quite nicely with people like Sartre and Beckett, Camus, Rothko perhaps, either in the small town setting, such as in this painting, called Sunday in 1926, or in the city, in this painting called Automat, but we'll go back to the previous one for the moment. And this man is, he's either deep in thought or deep in depression. He, we assume he's come out of this door, there's nobody else about, and it's a wooden broad, broad walk, so this is definitely a small town. The road is a strange colour for a road. It was easily get dirty, but it's not. It's painted in a bright colour. And I'm not quite sure about whether his feet would point down like that, or whether they would be more horizontal. He's hugging himself, notice. Um, and he looks a sad, sad figure to me. Then we come to the automat. An automat, uh, um, for those of you who don't know, is a fast food restaurant in America, which is served purely by vending machines. And if you didn't know that, neither did I till I looked it up. The woman sits alone in her thoughts. It's cold in there. Only one glove is removed to hold the cup. Her legs pressed together against the draft, perhaps. Curiously, they catch the light so that we sitting at the neighbouring table notice them first. As was his custom, he used Joe, his wife, as the model. 
but he's altered her features so that she's a much younger woman. And again, she's alone at the table. This chair is empty. There's another empty chair there. That's a rather sad looking radiator, I think. And there's no attempt to um, paint the, dark, the, the street outside because it's dark. So the light has been thrown inside, as is our attention. Although we, the glass, the plate glass is showing the lights, the uh, automats lights there. This painting probably reminds us of Degas, the absinthe drinker, another woman sitting at a table staring at her drink, although in this case it's alcohol, of course. And then there's Manet's plum brandy, <clears throat> again sitting in front of a drink, looking rather disconsolate and fed up, although she's smoking. So these, uh, the, in the automat, the woman is clearly sober. All three are abstracted in their loneliness. And then we come to Night Hawks, painted in 1942, perhaps the most famous uh, of Hopper's, or well-known of Hopper's paintings. The characters in the diner sit apart, predatory, shady and disinterested. But we're drawn to them as a passerby by the bright, contrasting interior lights. The street is deserted, dead. Shops are, of course, closed. But there's no neon advertising as we might have expected in the 1940s. The, fe the features of the uh, characters in this painting are typical copper. Uh, hopper, chiselled sharply and fleshless. As individuals, they're unattractive, up to no good, perhaps. Painted incapable of compassion, hardened by city life. It's very late, or these are the early hours of the city. The attendant is clearly making conversation with the couple, having already served them. The man looks at them looks at him expressionless, barely interested in what he's got to say, and the woman blankly contemplates something in her hand. I don't think it's a nail, uh, a nails, but at this distance it could be. The third customer drinks alone, away from the others. Plenty of social distancing here. There's something desolate about this painting, and yet magnetic. I'll leave that with you for a moment. I don't know whether it's these bright metal urns in the background here. They remind us a little bit of those pumps in the, in, in the painting gas. But I don't think we're invited to reveal them in any shape or form. Office in a small city painted in 1953, measuring 27 by 39. In this painting, the man, possibly a draftsman, looking at his desk, looks blankly out of his window. He's several stories high, as are we. There's no suggestion of glass in the two windows. Why? It's almost as though he's outside as well as being inside. There's one window, there's the other window. The painting has a geometric quality. The dark sienna of the buildings across the street contrast with the white concrete. In New York office painted in 1962, this time it's a woman who's highlighted alone in a large glassless window surrounded by concrete. It's a, almost a companion piece to the one previous. She looks vulnerable in her isolation. And the, con the concrete now is, uh, Hopper's decided to paint it with a light yellow wash rather than the pale white wash of the previous painting. She's reading something. The figures often seem to be doing something with documents, reading letters or rather, rather than just abstract. At least she's working anyway. She's not just gazing abstractly out of the window. Something more going on in this painting. It's called Conference at Night, painted in 1948. There's at least something 
we can talk about we have a sharp we have the sharp severe features of the individuals and the gesticulation of this man leaning on his arm there the woman paying attention to him and um see sharp features as well he does like his sharp features hopper there, there, there is no concession to gen gentleness i don't think about him he seems more interested in the large pale blue rectangle of light on the office wall and the shapes the street lights make on the office furniture we've got these uh, there's no chairs in this office i noticed they're just tables so what's going on in this office i don't know we've got this strange door partition door here which again doesn't seem to be hinged onto anything it's just just sort of hanging hanging hung out to dry as it were and then we've got these two ledges which must again relate to whatever is supposed to be going on in this office what on earth are they talking about we have no idea i like the jaunty jaunty angle that this this man's hat is on his head he looks slightly spivish i think but she's anything but spirit. She means business. And this lady does not take prisoners. Office at night, painted in 1940, only about two foot square, this is a little more detailed, though as voyeurs, oddly, we seem to be in the corner of the ceiling looking down on them. The light to the window makes a curious shape on the wall above the cabinet. And there it is. Not quite sure how it arrives at that shape. There's another hint. There's, uh, as I said, this hint of narrative here. The open window and its blind catching the breeze. The open door, the open drawer, and the woman's voluptuous figure, all painted for a reason. The man at the desk is reading out aloud, distracting her from her filing. She's turned towards him it's again as though it's a still from a movie we could have the sign the, the, the in big letters across the top here the name of the film possibly i'm reminded of the wasteland in these paintings of these city paintings where Eliot writes the line unreal city i had not thought death had undone so many is he painting the walking dead? Are his figures little more than automatons? You have to make your own minds up about that. But there is something of that in them, I think. Although there's narrative going on and they purport to be animated, they're not actually animated. They're waxworks, aren't they, really? I like the detail rare for hopper uh, can, about this old-fashioned typewriter well it wouldn't have been old-fashioned in those days and i like that chair as well and something very solid and dependable about that as is the desk indeed but we're certainly looking at this room from a curious angle and then we come to the last painting in rooms by the sea painted in 1951 there are no figures it's the rooms which are of interest and the and the possibly the parabolas of light on the walls there's no furniture in this first room only in the cropped interior room the sea view is curiously painted as though one could walk out of the patio window and plunge into the water from several stories up architects as i said earlier have suggested that the window could never cast such shapes of lights on the walls as in this one here and the one on in the interior um, wall hopper's not interested in that they are shapes he wants to paint regardless of their plausibility the position of the gazer's eye is also problematic although the room is shown from an elevated position there's a sense we're standing below the floor level Hopper's playing tricks with the laws of perspective, using light stylistically. I'll let you look at that painting for a moment, see if you can work out why we appear to be both above and below floor level. 
Was that his intention? And if it was his intention, why did he paint it like that? As a very strong blue, the sea is painted in a very strong blue and it's well painted too. It contrasts well with the with the very bright sunlight here. And that's what Harper wanted to do. He wanted to paint sunlight. He's quote he's quoted and if you watch documentaries on YouTube of Hopper talking about his painting, he often says it was his intention to paint light. That's what he was interested in, sunlight. And I think this is why this painting is particularly important because that is clearly what he's attempted to do here and, and what he's achieved, I would say. Oh, well, let's go back to the previous one. I, I, I've forgotten that was the last one. When speaking about the difficulty of interpreting his paintings, Hopper once, Hopper once said, so much of art is an expression of the subconscious that it seems to me most all of the important qualities are put there unconsciously and little of importance by the conscious intellect. Clement Greenberg, the American art critic, enigmatically wrote, Hopper was a simply a bad painter. But if he were better, if he were a better one, he probably would not have been such a great artist. Not quite sure what he means by that. For me, Hopper's pictures are a commentary on secular life, men and women at work, or briefly taking time out, surrounded by concrete and steel and motivated, motivated by a self-centric individualism it's as though he's saying this is not living but it is existing and that ladies and gentlemen concludes our consideration of hopper's paintings